But before I introduce her, I just want to remind you that there will be a seminar next Friday. We <laughs> I know you are so excited, Shocking. right? <laughs> so it will be by Kristen Hartzell from, from our own campus, but she's from the Aerospace Engineering Department. So it will be something about the, the space and <laughs> All right, so today I want to introduce uh, Dr. Kristen Faria. So she's actually from Oregon. She did her um, undergrad at the University of Oregon, studying some like uh, flow and uh, dynamic system. And then she uh, did her master at the University of California, Davis. And then she uh, got her degree and then worked on uh, um, how um, um, vegetation trap particles. And then soon, af soon after she got the master's, she moved to UC Berkeley and did her uh, PhD with um, Professor Michael Mega. And actually, Kristen and I overlapped for a year. So when she was a first year student, I was a fifth year student. And we actually took the same class. And this is an undergraduate class, so you know. Never <laughs> be shy about taking lower, lower level class. Anyways. So um, in her PhD, um, she and her advisor, they study various topics, but they are all about volcano, um, volcanic process and volcano deformation. It's mostly about the dynamics and then some uh, quantitative and then some um, scale analysis. So that includes pyroclastic flow. And then, so if you remember last semester, we have um, Ben Andrew came in here, coming here and tell you about pyroclastic flow and then how they Try the particle motion, so Kristen was involved in this project. And then um, she also studied pumice. And because she studied pumice uh, in submarine volcanoes, I mean, she, had, she got a chance to go to, uh, to all the cruises in all kinds of different, uh, all different um, oceans and, and all of that, see all the cool um, stuff. I believe she will show some, something today about related to a submarine um, volcano eruption. So she finished her PhD earlier this year, and then she moved to um, what's called Oceanographic Institution. So, um, so um, she's starting um, April this year. So I think that's it. And then today she's going to um, talk about submarine volcanic eruption, why some rocks flow, and some other things. Thanks, Wang Han, and thanks everybody. I've had a really nice visit so far today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, where volcanic material goes when volcanoes erupt underwater and why. And right now you're looking at a picture of a, a pumice raft. This is a floating pumice on the surface of the ocean. Um, the, the, gray, the, the brown material, excuse me, is pumice is about 15 to 20 kilometers wide. And this photo was taken from a passenger airplane. And it's actually this photo that allowed us um, to recognize uh, the, the largest submarine silicic eruption in modern history. So despite all our technology, we're still relying on passenger air, uh, passengers and airplanes in order to identify eruptions. Um, rock set, yeah, we, didn't, we need that. Um, and so before, so today this, I'm going to talk a lot about pumice. Um, and so I, I want to start by defining pumice. It's a porous volcanic rock. It's probably my favorite kind of rock. Um, so you have a couple pictures of pumice from uh, that particular eruption. And um, you have some pictures of, of the rock in 2D. So the, the white up in the upper right is the rock. And the black is the empty space, the voids, the pores. So pumice is, is incredibly porous up to um, sometimes 80, 90 percent um, uh, porous space. And then if, if we all know pumice um, from uh, the loofahs down here on the right. Um, so a couple other pictures of pumice. If you look up close in an SE image, you see this bubbly foam texture that's been created um, as, as gas exhausts from the magma and creates this porous volcanic texture uh, to begin with. And, and pumice can come in a range of sizes from the millimeter scale, it can be an ash sized particle, up to uh, meter scales, really large blocks of, of pumice. Um, and you can have a range of textures. Um, you can create these, these rocks both on land and explosive eruptions, as well as in the deep sea, as I'll show you today. Um, and so, so pumice is, is sort of de defined by its porosity. Oh, 
and there are multiple textures of pumice. So up on the upper left, you see round vesicles, and then you see elongated uh, vesicles, which is in the vesicles are another word for the pores, uh, the pore space on the upper right. And, and so pumice is defined as a very porous rock, so I wanted to find the term porosity to begin with. Um, porosity is just the ratio of the empty space, the pores, compared to the total volume of the material. And there's two types of porosity. There's this open porosity up here in the upper right that's connected to the outside, and there's closed porosity that's disconnected. And porosity differs from another word I'll use later on today, permeability, which measures how easily a fluid can flow through a, a, a material. And so you can have uh, the same porosity, like on the left and on the right, in a different permeability, just depending on the shape, the orientation, and the connectedness of the pores. Um, but to bring this back to submarine eruptions, I'm interested in submarine eruptions in part because um, most volcanism on Earth happens underwater. Over 80% of Earth's volcanism is submarine. And um, as a recent... Uh, as recently re reported here, um, a lot of that submarine volcanism is basaltic and it's concentrated at our, our mid-ocean ridges, highlighted here with the yellow earthquakes and the plate boundaries. And so this basaltic volcanism is predominantly effusive and you make these nice um, effusive pillow lava flows and other sheet flows um, in the submarine world. But um, as also pointed out here, we have about equal proportions of silicic volcanism on land and on sea. So in addition to the, this basaltic mid-ocean ridge spreading, we have a lot of silicic volcanism in the deep sea. And, and despite the predominance of effusive eruptions, fragmentation, the breaking of volcanic material, is extremely common underwater. And so uh, some of the evidence of that are volcanic ash particles. I'm just using this term to refer to small uh, volcanic particulates, less than two millimeters and my favorite, pumice class. So pumice uh, records the, the fragmentation, the breaking of volcanic rock underwater. And all this fragmented material is, is really important, not just for recognizing the sort of the signatures and styles of submarine volcanism, where you have ex whether you have effusive or explosive submarine eruptions, but this fragmented material affects larger scale Earth systems. So, for example, the delivery of volcanic material can fertilize the oceans, it can affect biologic productivity. Um, in some places, up to 20, 30, even 40 percent of oceanic sediment is made up of volcanic material, and that has implications for um, reverse weathering and other pro geochemical processes that eventually can affect climate. And so, um, for all these reasons, I really care about the present. Yep, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. be a very basic question. Yeah. Um, so you said, I, I just couldn't get over it, because mm -hmm. you said that half of all the, uh, I guess, felsic or silicic volcanoes mm -hmm. are underwater. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, because like the way that I think of it, okay, so I have all of my like, silicic volcanoes involve either flux melting in the subduction zone or maybe contact melting in some kind of continental crust. So where are these guys? Are they all like in some ocean ocean subduction areas or what's going on? So I, I agree that it's hard to get these sort of estimates, like robust estimates, but I think that comes from just the length of subduction zones that are underwater. Okay. So they are related to the subduction zones, they mm -hmm. just happen to be okay. Underwater. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so please interrupt me at any point with questions. Questions are, are really great. So um, so we have all this fragmented material. Um, a lot of it can happen in subduction zone settings that are underwater. But as a recent National Academy of Sciences report points out, we we're still don't really understand the processes that disperse all this fragmented material underwater and what the processes that govern um, where all this material ends up in our geologic record and in the oceans. And so this um, relates to my main research focus, which is understanding how it is that volcanic material and other Earth's surface flows are dispersed um, across Earth's surface and in our oceans. And um, I, put, I put this picture in here of Santiguito Volcano in Guatemala to illustrate that on land we can actually watch volcanic eruptions happen in real time. We can go to the deposits and sample them. And because of those two things, we actually have a pretty good understanding of of the processes, the, the plumes, the density currents that disperse volcanic material 
Um, but by comparison, <coughs> underwater, there are few eruptions that are really, we can really actually directly observe. Only 11, we've only actually seen about 11 eruptions, or documented 11 submarine eruptions in the past 30 years. Um, we, we've witnessed mid-ocean ridge eruptions via, with seismicity, but not with direct observations. And then it's, it's hard to access deposits. And, um, and then because water properties are different from air properties, the heat capacity, the density, we can't just apply our, our models for, for subaerial uh, volcanoclastic dispersal to the submarine environment. And so um, today's talk is going to be focused on some of the class scale processes and um, the rock scale processes that govern where it is that volcanic material ends up when it's erupted in, in water. And I'm going to use the 2012 Havre eruption for, that the first photo is from as, as a guide um, to motivate these three questions. Why it is that some class float and others sink? What processes control the saturation of porous glass? Because the saturation will control its, their density and their ability to remain buoyant. And then finally, um, why it is that pumice floats for years. And then if there's time, although I, I really want to leave a lot of room for questions, um, I may address my current work on ash production dispersal at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. <coughs> so the Havre 2012 eruption, it produced the, the beautiful pumice raft that was um, witnessed in, by that passenger airplane. Um, but it, the, a volcanic eruption occurred um, here in the Kermadec Arc from a subduction zone volcano. Um, there's New Zealand for context. And um, in 2012, the volcano produced a pumice raft, um, first shown here in tan. And that pumice raft spread over 100 kilometers to this area in green in about a week. And this pumice raft contained over a cubic kilometer of, of uh, rhyolitic, really silicic volcanic material, making it uh, rival um, the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption in terms of volume. And so this, this eruption then is our, this largest deep sea submarine eruption we've ever really witnessed um, directly. And so in 2015, um, I was fortunate to be able to go on a research cruise with um, a wonder, number of really great people. So this cruise was led by Adam Sewell and Rebecca Carey, a number of uh, collaborators, to go um, sample and, and map the submarine volcanic deposits that corresponded uh, to this pumice raft and this eruption. And just to give you a quick timeline, in, in 2000 there was a bathymetric survey of the submarine volcano, so we at least knew a little bit about its um, shape and size before the eruption. The 2012 eruption happened in uh, 2012, and in 2015 we went to map and sample the deposits. Okay, so uh, in order to, to actually go down to the seafloor, we had two special tools. Um, we had Jason, which is a remotely operated vehicle. This is tethered to the ship, so we can operate it from, from the ship, and it has cameras and um, arms, so we're able to sample uh, the deposits and take video images. Um, and then we had Sentry. Sentry um, is an, uh, sorry, did I say autonomous? I meant remotely operated vehicle. Sentry is an autonomous uh, underwater vehicle. And Sentry, in, in addition to other things, is able to survey the seafloor at really high resolution and build um, highly detailed uh, maps. So going from sort of this level of, of bathymetric resolution of a volcanic cone before Sentry to that afterwards. And so I'll show you what we found. So this is, this is Havre. Um, submarine volcano. It is, and this is a, a rendering by uh, Fumi Gami um, from uh, Tasmania of the sentry data. So you're looking at a caldera that's about five or six kilometers wide. Um, it's, it's, if you know Crater Lake, it's like seeing Crater Lake under about a kilometer of water. And the new features as of 2012 are shown in red. And so I'll show you those again. So um, from the 2012 erup eruption, there were a number of new lava domes uh, shown in yellow and lava flows shown in green. Um, but I really want to focus on one particular deposit. So this deposit is a, a large number of giant pumice on the seafloor. <laughs> <laughs> and these, these, these pieces of pumice um, were really big. Um, they're at least a meter, up to seven meters. And we know they're pumice because we sampled them, we brought them back up, we looked at their textures, and, and they're all pumice. 
And so the pumice from this eruption, the giant pumice, was dispersed between these two dashed blue lines. And so we think that they became originated from this cone here. And um, the presence of all this pumice on the sea floor uh, really raised the question, why is it that so much pumice was on the sea floor, and yet you also had um, an even larger amount of pumice in the raft? And from the textures of the two, the raft and the subsea floor pumice, we think that they're related. They both have uh, gray banding. They both have similar dispersal patterns. And and however, about a cubic kilometer material ended up on the raft, and only a tenth of a cubic kilometer of pumice ended up on the seafloor in this giant pumice deposit. So this really raises the question then, why is it that so much material went into the raft, whereas a smaller amount of large pieces of pumice remained on the seafloor relatively close to the vent? And in order to address this question, we really have to understand what, what affects or controls the buoyancy of these porous class in water. So how is it that that pumice and water actually saturate and cool? So I'm going to address this, this second question first um, with a series of laboratory experiments. So in order to figure out how it is that pumice saturate and cool, we conducted a series of experiments in the lab. And what we did is we took individual pieces of pumice about um, anywhere from a centimeter scale to, to a large grapefruit in size, and we drilled a hole into about the middle of the clast. Um, we inserted a, a thermocouple into the middle in order to measure temperature, um, and we sealed that thermocouple in. Um, we then put the pumice in, the ov in an oven, heated it up to several hundred degrees Celsius, and then took the pumice out, it's air filled, and we quickly plunged it into water in order to measure how its internal temperature changed through time. Um, at the same time we did that, we also uh, uh, hooked the pumice up to a scale. Um, and so initially this, this piece of pumice was really buoyant because it was filled with air and it pushed up on the scale and made a negative weight. But as the pumice saturated with liquid water, it began to pull down and um, the weight would go up. So the submerged weight then corresponded to the amount of liquid water inside. So, yes? This, we used fresh water, and the fresh water was at, was at room temperature. Yeah. Um, so I'll show you what we found. So now we're looking at a curve. This is time versus internal temperature of a pumice, but this is one that we took out of the oven and let cool in air. So this is a nice uh, conductive uh, cooling curve. It's an exponential decline. And internal temperature, this is similar in that if you took a turkey out of the oven, this is how its internal temperature would decline with time due to conductive cooling. Um, so now that you've seen this, I just want to ask you what you might expect. Inst if you take the same exact same clast, put it in the oven, and submerge it in water instead of air. So I will show you. So now this is the same class cooling in, in liquid water instead of in air. And you see there's a, a really fast, rapid decline in internal temperature at first. You get this inflection point uh, right around 100 degrees C Celsius, the phase change temperature, which is kind of interesting. And then um, a nice exponential decline or gradual decline after that. And at the same time we measured the internal temperature, we also measured the submerged weight. So this is what those results look like. You have the submerged weight going up rapidly at first, and then at the same point you have an inflection point in temperature, you have also have an inflection point in submerged weight. And so uh, just to point out that, that those two things look, uh, correlate. So it's suggestive that at that time showed with the red line, there's some sort of change in process that's um, affected or being effect or affecting both the internal temperature, the cooling, and the saturation. And uh, um, this was a pretty robust result um, throughout all our class. So I'll just show you another example of a different class cooling from um, over 600 C. So the details of the internal temperature um, and what I'm calling the first stage are, are a little bit different, but in both cases you see this inflection point in both the saturation and cooling curves. And in the future, I'm going to just mark that with a, with a star, just to, so you know 
um, the stars in the next graphs correspond to this inflection point as well. So I'll show you a little bit more data before my interpretation. And so now what we're looking at are repeat experiments done at different temperatures on the exact same class. So this is time versus the flux of liquid going in. So this is the time derivative of the change in um, saturation. So um, it's the rate that water is flowing in. And the different colors correspond to different uh, initial class of different initial temperatures. So I just want to point out that the hottest class tend to have a little bit lower initial saturation rate than the coolest ones, and that saturation rate seems to be about the same. And as you increase the class initial temperature, it takes longer to reach that inflection point um, in both curves. So we can plot that a little bit differently. So this is initial temperature versus that transition time. And as the initial temperature of the class goes up, it takes longer and longer to reach that inflection point in both internal temperature and submerged weight. So uh, now, I'll tell you what, now I'll tell you what I think is going on um, with these clasts. So initially, as you put a hot pumice in water, we see that air flows out a little bit. These are initially air filled. But as air flows out, liquid water can flow in, but the internal temperature is still very, very hot. It's hundreds of degrees C and above the boiling temperature. And so that ingested water, I think, is converted into steam relatively quickly inside the clast. And that's sort of analogous to a pumice that's erupting from a submarine volcano that may initially start out filled with magmatic gases, which are mostly steam. And so as, as water goes in, you initially set up, you set up this situation where you have steam on the inside, but the outside may, is in contact with colder water and may be cool and have a little rind of, of liquid water on the outside. And so then in order to saturate further, you have to condense that steam and uh, create a volume change that can then draw liquid water in so the class saturates further. And so in order to condense the steam, you have to lo oops, lower the internal temperature below the boiling point, in our case 100 C. And in order to cool the class, you have to get the conduct the heat out, uh, probably through this cool by going through this cool liquid rind. So you set up the situation where the saturation becomes cooling limited. So you need to cool in order to condense the internal steam in order to make more room and draw in more liquid water. And so please, if there are any questions, please let me know. But in order to test this idea, we, saw, we um, created a model where we solved the heat conduction equation on a sphere. Um, and we track the location of the 100 degree C isotherm, which is um, basically this condensation interface, the boundary between liquid water and steam. And uh, we include the effects of latent heat in this calculation, so we had a Stefan number. Um, and we also included the effects of advecting or bringing in and drying in cold liquid water into the clast. Yeah, yeah. Below the ocean, one megapascal roughly. So this was all at atmospheric pressure. But if you're, if, you're down, if you're that deep, your phase change temperature is going to be different. But you're still above the critical point of water, so you will have a difference between the liquid and, and sort of vapor phases. So, mm -hmm. yeah. just to make sure, um, so we, you, we are talking about what happened in the, inside of the pores, right? Inside the pores, mm -hmm. Right, and uh, the grains, the solid is wet with liquid. You, the liquid is the wetting phase, yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, I guess uh, steam would be much faster to um, be, be propellant. So on, in a few slides, I'm going to talk about sort of percolation processes. But in these models, we've um, assumed or haven't taken percolation type processes into account. So the, mo the model I created is purely a, a conduction or a cooling based <coughs> model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you say you included vection into the, into the pore space, mm -hmm. and, and you solve the heat equation, but do you account for the fact that the water being heated up is going to conduct as well? So like, are you solving the advection equation as well? No, we didn't account for counterflows or any sort of advection in the class. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so in, in many ways, this is a, it's a continuum scale model with, with a few assumptions um, about we weren't solving the fluid equations within the pores. Uh, so 
this model, however, was able to match our observations in the sense that we could um, predict or match the time at which um, the inflection point in our observations occurred, which I'm interpreting to be the point in time at which all the internal vapor has condensed. And so there's no more steam anywhere inside the clast. And so right now you're looking at time in seconds versus a normalized front position. So this is one represents this um, isotherm or condensation interface at the edge of the clast. And zero means um, all the steam is condensed and that interface is in the, in the middle or uh, non-existent. And so the black dots are calculated from our observations and the gray lines are modeled um, via our con conduction equation, our Stefan problem. And so we find that uh, we can predict the time at which the condensation interface reaches the center of the class. And so this lends some support, at least to our, our cooling hypothesis or cool idea that cooling controls the saturation of porous clasts. Um, this model also importantly uh, neglects permeability, so it doesn't really take into account the resistance of, of the rock structure to fluid flow. Um, and we used a scaling analysis to demonstrate that you can neglect permeability um, when permeabilities are large or above about 10 to the negative 15, which is reasonable in pumice which that has permeabilities of about 10, range from 10 to the negative 10 to maybe 10 to the negative uh, 13 uh, meters squared. So uh, we concluded then that cooling controls the saturation of these big porous class initially when they're steam filled. Um, but briefly, I just want to show you, bring you back to this uh, figure where we have the first stage where cooling is really limiting saturation. And then you have the second stage. And using some additional modeling, I won't show you all the details of here. Uh, we concluded that thermal conduction is again responsible for cooling during the second stage and that the class saturate due to um, thermal contraction of any residual trapped gas inside the, inside the clast. So going back to um, the first two questions, uh, number two, what controls the saturation of porous clasts? Well, we found that it's the cooling that controls, uh, sorry, the saturation. And um, so I want to go now to the first question, why is it that some clasts float and others sink, in particular related to the Havre eruption? Well, using our new saturation model for porous class or cooling, cooling and saturation model, uh, we can predict uh, the rate at which liquid water goes into class because uh, the rate of water ingestion is balancing the rate of steam condensation. So uh, here is our cooling rate divided by latent heat of vaporization and a porosity is proportional to the, the rate of liquid water flowing into the class. And we validated this at least for some sm the smaller class in our experiments, um, where this is a, the predicted flux to the observed flux, and that's a one-to-one -one line. So if, we, so if we use this model then to predict the rate that what liquid water is going into the class, we can calculate how its buoyancy is changing through time. And so here, what I'm showing is the class, the size of the class versus the time in minutes. The dashed line represents the time when the pumice reaches a point of neutral buoyancy um, due to saturation. And the solid line is the time at which that class will take to rise to the ocean surface, assuming that its velocity can be calculated by this equation and its density here is changing due to saturation. And the intercept of these two lines represents the smallest class that's able to reach the ocean surface from a depth of about 1,000 meters. And so what this means is that anything smaller than about a half meter for a 70% porosity class is going to cool and saturate too quickly to reach the ocean surface, um, whereas anything bigger than about a half meter is able to be able to stay hot and buoyant and eventually reach the ocean surface before it, um, it becomes negatively buoyant. Yeah. Didn't you show us that size pumice on the bottom? Big pumice on the bottom? Mm -hmm. Great question. We're gonna that's a bit of a new paradox that we've introduced here. So we're gonna it was really big pumice on the seafloor. So I think that that pumice, based on this, made it up to the surface, um, or made it close at least. Um, <laughs> 
So this is a partial answer then with that caveat. Why is it that some pumice float and others sink? Well, small pumice, less than a half meter, and for this particular eruption, are going to cool so fast, they'll saturate quickly, and they won't reach the ocean's surface. And indeed, close to this vent where we think most of the pumice came out, we do see an apron of smaller pumice relative to the giant pumice we see elsewhere. Um, but before I, I go back to these, the question about why is it we see big pumice right next to the event too, um, I want to go to the surface, go to the pumice raft. Um, so this, is, this was our Havre pumice raft. Um, it dispersed quite far around the ocean, and it could actually stay afloat for months or even years. So this is a picture um, almost about nine months after initial eruption in March 2013. The pumice was still floating, and it was covered in uh, biology. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and just to give you a flavor for what these pumice rafts look like, uh, this is another pumice raft from Home Reef Volcano in 2006. Um, you get pumice all around the surface. A boat just flowed through this. Um, this is the Havre pumice raft. I believe that's a 100 kilometer scale bar. Um, it, it's quite a large uh, piece of material. And, and then here's all the little st some of the strands of the pumice raft after it breaks apart. Mm -hmm. So what's the dominant uh, material size in, in the raft? So you said it should be stuff Big. bigger than half a meter? Great question. So we don't know what the initial size distribution of the raft was because no one was there to originally see it. Um, the first observers got to the raft about a month after the eruption, and pumice in a raft um, is experiencing wave action, and they're abrasive, and so they're grinding up against each other and potentially breaking down. We don't know exactly how quickly they break down, but um, potentially quickly enough so that you see much smaller pieces later on. Um, there was about at least a half meter sized pumice, though, one month after the eruption. So. Uh, I, I, so the pumice is able to uh, float and potentially stay floating for a long time if it doesn't break down due to this abrasive process. But the ability for pumice to float for a long time is actually pretty unexpected because the pores of pumice are highly connected and water wets volcanic glass. And so if you model, um, you can model the saturation of a porous class like pumice due to Darcy flow, where pressure gradients drive flow in, and you find um, that your model can actually match observations pretty well for some porous material like a sponge. But if you compare this model for, for um, the saturation of porous media to observations from pumice, you see that pumice actually floats long, much longer than you're predicted. So this is the time here versus the size, and this porous media saturation model is here, and we're off by several orders of magnitude. And so this really raises the question then, if, if pumice pores are mostly entirely all connected, water wets volcanic glass, why is it that pumice is able to float for so long at all? Um, however, there are circumstances when water infiltrates a porous media that the gas can become trapped. And by gas, I mean air or CO2 or a non-condensable gas phase. Um, and the propensity for gas trapping increases as the, as the effects of surface tension increase. Um, so as the capillary number, the ratio of viscous to surface tension forces um, goes, goes down. And this, this process, this gas trapping process, is really important for oil reservoirs, for CO2 sequestration. It's been studied in a number of other hydrologic contexts. And so my hypothesis then is that it's the trapped gas, the ability to surround liquid water around a non-condensable gas like air or CO2 that allows pumice to stay afloat in rafts for as long as uh, they do. And so to test this idea, we conducted a series of experiments where we put um, pumice in water. Um, we heated some of the pumice up first. We left others at room temperature, and uh, we let it sit. And then we, after a couple days, we took the pumice out, and we really quickly encased it in wax. And so the wax just preserved that internal distribution of fluids inside the clast. And then we put the pumice um, into an x-ray microtomography a machine at, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to image the three-dimensional distribution of uh, the gas, the water, and the rock. And so here's what we found. So these are 2D slices through our pumice. 
uh, the black is the rock, the white is the gas, and the blue is the liquid water. And we find that there's liquid water in many cases um, surrounding the gas phase. It's not just the rock that's enclosing uh, the gas inside. And we find this for both hot and um, ambient te temperature pieces of pumice. And so this is a, a three-dimensional video um, showing what the bright, brightly color, the bright colors are these different gas bubbles that are totally disconnected from each other. And um, the, the glass, the rock, was what was just shown and went away. And then the water that's present inside will sh show up here in a moment. So that's the water that's rising up inside of, um, inside of these clasts. And so I just want to show you the shapes of the different gas bubbles inside. We see, like a we see a range of shapes from these interconnected ganglia to big isolated gas bubbles to many small isolated gas bubbles. So there, there's a range of different geometries that we see. We do find that hot pumice traps less gas than ambient temperature pumice. But in general, we find that, that the gas trapping via the capillary processes and surface tension um, traps enough gas to allow pumice to float for long periods of time, uh, months to years. Yeah? Is the gas in the natural uh, materials in the rafts, is that volcanic gas or is that atmospheric gas? So if it's a submarine eruption, initially the gas will all be volcanic gas. And volcanic gas is mostly uh, water, so it's steam when the pumice is hot, or it can be CO2. And um, this gas trapping process only occurs with a, a non-condensable gas like CO2 or air. And so inherent sort of in the observation that the, the raft can flow is that once a steamy pumice reaches the surface, that the, it has to be able to ingest air in order to be able to float. Or it has to mostly contain CO2. But do you know which it is? No, we don't know which it is. I think it's mostly um, steam, though, and uh, I have a few ideas that we'll test later on about how the air gets in. Um, so good point, thanks for bringing, bringing that up. Um, but eventually the pumice doesn't float forever. It eventually either grinds down, washes aso ashore, or is able to sink to the bottom of the ocean. And so what is it that allows the pumice to eventually sink? And um, our hypothesis or the thought is that these isolated gas bubbles that are surrounded by water um, can diffuse through the liquid water and eventually to larger bubbles and eventually out to the atmosphere. So um, we think that it's the diffusion of these trapped gas bubbles that eventually limits the pumice flotation time. Um, and so in order to test this idea, we conducted very complicated pumice flotation experiments. Um, we put pumice on water and uh, waited until they sank and measured the, the total amount of time they stayed afloat. And uh, so I'll show you our results here. So this is pumice size. This is the volume um, versus the total flotation time. We had to be a little bit patient. And uh, actually, the red data are mine in this case, and the black data come from um, the literature. And um, this is the, the original uh, prediction from the Darcy flow model in the beginning of uh, the talk, and then the gray band represents a diffusion prediction. We find that the, the time scale of flotation scales with the uh, length squared, which is consistent with uh, diffusion controlling the, the flotation of, of these pumice. And, and so we, we know that pumice is able to float because it can ingest air, or has some non-condensable gas that's held in via surface tension, and uh, sinks before because of uh, gas diffusion. Um, we also found that small class can cool and saturate really fast so they don't make it to the surface. And yet, as was pointed out earlier, we see these giant pieces of pumice on the seafloor really close to the vent. So how does that occur? So in order to at least start to address this question, um, we took samples from the raft and from uh, fragments of giant pumice on the seafloor and we heated them up and put them in liquid water. And um, we did the same X-ray microtomography experiments on these pumice as I did earlier and looked at the proportions of trapped gas versus liquid water um, inside. And so now I'm comparing these, comparing these 2D slices between the raft pumice and um, the giant pumice on the seafloor. And we find that 
um, where the, the white is rock, the blue is water, and the black is gas. And we find that the raft pumice stay nice and gassy and full of, full of air, whereas the seafloor pumice, the giant pumice, are able to ingest more liquid water, not trap gas, and therefore um, not remain buoyant because um, they don't have enough of gas inside of them. And so I, I don't think that this is the, the final answer to this question, but at least shows that there's something different enough about these two pieces of pumice that allow the seafloor pumice to ingest more water, not trap gas, whereas the giant pumice stays um, full of gas and able to stay afloat. And a colleague of mine, um, Megan Jones, she measured the connected porosity of these two samples. Um, so, and she found that the raft pumice does have some isolated, disconnected porosity. And that is important because it means that no matter um, how much time you put, leave the, the pumice in water, it's not going to be able to absorb that water. But that isolated porosity isn't quite enough to allow the pumice to float on its own. It still needs some residual gas trapping via surface tension. So I want to bring all these observations and, and um, models together now into our interpretation of the Havre um, 2012 eruption. And so we found that both the size of the pumice and its ability to trap gas versus ingest water affects its partitioning between seafloor pumice and, and pumice that ends up in the raft and is able to float far away, um, far from the vent. And that's because cooling rather than permeability controls the saturation of glass and because um, pumice floats because of gas trapping and surface tension. Um, and, and that's what allows pumice to stay in this raft. So if we look at our, our cartoon of the, our picture of the eruption, um, we have uh, the volcano sending uh, fragmented material into the water column. The small pumice uh, fall out next to the vent because they cool too fast and saturate. The big pumice make it to the surface, um, but depending on how much water versus gas they ingest here, they either stay in the raft or end up on the seafloor. Um, so, yeah. I'll ask you a question specifically. Mm -hmm. As you've introduced this diagram, you've introduced another parameter that wasn't talked about, mm -hmm. and that is the gas plume. So, in the upcoming rafters, mm -hmm. um, what is the ratio of uh, magmatic gases that are coming up relative to the surrounding seafloor? Do they create themselves a chimney that really has a low water content? So there are a couple thoughts. One, we don't know whether or not there was a gaseous plume so that's, here. So that's just a, a fake news. Well, I don't think, so this gas plume refers to the steam that was generated at the surface. So the satellite images show there was a steam plume at the surface, but whether or not that represents a plume that extends from the vent to the surface, we don't know. There might be steam generation just locally. Um, yeah, exactly. And the, the, the heat capacity of the ocean is really large, the ocean is really cold, and so if you put any steam into the ocean, it is going to rapidly condense. And so in order to retain a gaseous plume for, for that distance, a thousand meters, you'd have to have a lot of steam. Um, in addition, in the experiments, we don't see sheaths of steam around the pumice. We think the steam is really in the hottest part of the pumice, the part that's above the boiling temperature, which is the inside. And that sort of differs from the conceptual models that existed before that showed these steam sheaths on the outside. So well, that leads me to another question and another related thing. Mm -hmm. So if I look at the uh, <coughs> areas of the world that have really beautiful, significant pumice eruptions, Mm -hmm. I think of, let's say, Newbury Caldera. Okay. Um, I was expecting the dome to be an obsidian dome, mm -hmm. I don't know if it is. It and is. I don't know, have we seen um, a pumice eruption like that? that uh, the scale that puts out Newbury scale pumice? So, have we seen it in the air? So, this is the largest. Um, I, the reason wait. I ask is specifically because we don't know what the plume looks like, nor how much gas emission it has, do we? So we've seen a number of sub-aerial eruptions, oh. large rhyolitic um, eruptions, the Mount St. Helens um, eruptions, yeah, like for, for example. We haven't seen a super eruption, if that's what you're referring to. No, I'm talking to. about something that really puts out enormous amounts of pumice leading to a glass dome. Yeah, so Newberry, I mean, Newberry does have a dome. And um, it has a massive pumice, you know, very large pumice. Yeah. Material that 
So I think we have seen a number of, of volcanic eruptions on land that produce pumice and produce plumes and then transition to effusive domes. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe you disagree, I guess I would, I think of Mount Salem. Yeah, now conversation to wine. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious, is, are, is all, are all the pumices the same rock composition? Or are the giant pumices a different rock type, a different type of magma, for example? Or? They all have the same uh, composition. They're all very rhyolitic, about 70% silica. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You showed a, a slide of the sinker and the floater. Mm -hmm. um, the texture looked different to me. Did you do textual analysis? We the have proportion of glass to open space looks mm -hmm. quite different. I'm just mm -hmm. a observation, but it could be just those samples or Right, yeah, so we have compared the porosities of the two. They're pretty equal, right around 80% porosity. The textural differences that I've analyzed, to me, I haven't been able to pull out something that's robustly different, um, other than the isolated porosity in the raft that's present at times, and we don't see that at all in the giant pumice, and that's um, in a paper by Sam Mitchell that, that is in review um, in Hawaii. Um, but there is something I agree, probably different about the textures that we haven't quite been able to put our, put our finger on yet. Um, in general, it's difficult to tell, uh, well, the subaerial versus the submarine, but in this case, we're just comparing these two submarine pumice um, to each other. Mm -hmm. So last week I put a candy jar on a cold countertop and it exploded. Um, so it is fracture part of the, um, the, the shape part of the model when you take mm -hmm. a hot rock and you put it into water, which is a two or three degrees C? Absolutely, yeah. Magma water interactions we definitely should be thinking about. Um, in this paper by Michael Minga, he proposed that um, you actually break these class apart, you create the giant pumice due to magma water interactions and quench fracturing. And the curvy planar textures and surfaces on the pumice um, could be evidence for that as well. Does it increase the permeability? The fracturing? Yes. Um, well, if the fracturing occurs potentially all along uh, pores that were already large, then by fracturing the pumice, you're actually making the pumice smaller, so it can't contain as big of pores anymore, so it might actually decrease the permeability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I think this is really cool. Yeah. So this, this could be a mechanism for producing mechanical and financial in oceanic crust. Mm. Right? So if you have a layer of stuff, like you have um, the uh, kilo of salt and then a layer of uh, pumice. So I think how spread the floating pumice could, um, could influence uh, the mechanical and in the um, uh, subducting slug. Yeah. Um, do you have any sense of how spread it can get? So pumice in these rafts has been attributed before, almost spreading all the way around the southern pole. Um, so I think that these processes matter because, in part because they can spread pumice so far and volcanic material so far. And that matters for exactly the reason you mentioned, that you're affecting what's in the oceanic sediment where it's deposited what gets subducted and where. Um, and do we have uh, answers to those questions? Those are exactly the questions I'm working on. So um, they're still in progress, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So, OK, that's great then. Thanks. <laughs>so that um, we might have to talk about I, I have if we have 10 more minutes I can mention it but I um, we might have to talk about that at the reception yeah so you've, you've done some experiments in the laboratory where you've looked at the cooling um, of pumice under the different conditions right mm -hmm. have you thought about what happens when, when you inject a foam into the water and how it fragments when you basically put it into this actually overlying water column to sort of study how maybe a pumice cloud of this material yeah, there have been a number of people that have looked at magma water interactions and quench fragmentation and how it is that volcanic material breaks apart, but I think there's still a lot we don't understand. And I'd be interested in doing experiments along those lines in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I have a yeah. So you show that um, staining of the, the fine and that you show more um, liquid um, 
um, gas face in the mm -hmm. um, was the imaging. Yeah. So that is, I guess, as a third, that is, you take, you have taken the sample from the like outside rim of the giant pumice. I was wondering if you take some sample in the center of the pumice, if that would be like homogeneous structure or would be very heterogeneous. So we only have one pumice that we collected in its entirety because these pumice are really, really big. They're meters, so it's hard to get them to the surface. And so at the end of the cruise, we collected one giant pumice by having Jason bear hug the pumice and bring it, bring it up to the surface. And the ROV technicians were super excited because, you know, you get to collect a really big rock. Um, but other, other than that one, we don't have anything of, we just have the outside of the clasts. But that single rock, you know, I believe you have to, might have to check out the paper by Sam Mitchell. It's coming out soon, but um, I don't believe that there are huge differences between the outside and the inside. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm just curious because of the porosity and the location of these vents and gases. Is anyone, is anyone working microbes in policies? I mean, is that, is mm. that a hot for microbes? So it was really interesting to go to the seafloor, and even three years after the eruption, there was a lot of colonization by um, bacteria and other biology. And Rebecca Carey um, is interested in, in having another cruise to go back and look at how this colonization occurs and sort of the connections between volcanism and, and biology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, initially, I think over the time scale of the eruption, like hours to days, you won't necessarily. Um, well, I don't know actually, but I, I wouldn't think that that you would have colonization on that scale. But certainly over the year that the raft is floating, it, it transports um, biota pretty far. Yeah. Another question: Do you have any idea about the duration of this eruption? Yeah, we do from the satellite images. It lasted for about 20, 20, the raft forming phase lasted for 26 hours. So do you think the pumice that's been produced from during this sequence would, would have the like, gas content or material composition being a constant from the beginning to the end? And if that would affect like the, another additional perimeter being floating or sinking, do you think that would be playing um, it's hard to, we don't necessarily have a time series of samples between that 26 hours, so it's hard to assess what changes could occur along that time. But a paper by Michael Minga is in review that addresses some of the textural changes potentially that could happen from the, the beginning to the end of an eruption. Yeah. Yes, Beth. This is a, another simple question. Okay. So you said that the first photograph came seven days later, seven days after eruption from a passenger plane. I guess someone just taking a picture outside the window. Mm -hmm. To me, I would, I would assume that there was one of the many satellites that we have that image the globe that are commercial satellites would have taken pictures mm -hmm. earlier than that. And you could test the hypothesis of how large these skies are, whether they got smaller or not. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Am I crazy? Because I feel like there's like, mm -hmm every day uh, pictures so, that are taken by these uh, private companies. So we've tried, I've, I've, shaking his head there. I've tracked down <laughs> some of the um, private satellite imagery that is higher resolution, meter scale, yeah. and um, unfortunately you can't resolve individual pumice clasts when the pixels are a square meter. So um, we don't know if that means that the pumice were smaller than that or not, or just unresolvable. Um, so how, when were these photographs taken? These ones, I think, the, the soonest ones that I could find were like two or three weeks after the eruption. Yeah, but by then you already know it's small, right? Potentially, yeah. Yeah, I don't quote me, I, might not, I may not remember exactly when that satellite image was taken. It might have been one week, I, I can't recall. But we did Yeah, look. I guess one meter is challenging. Yeah. 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 It's not that challenging. I mean, we can reach license plates from space. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> we should be looking for pumice rafts, too, I think. Yeah. You have to convince someone. <laughs> I do think there's, yeah. You know, the NNSA. <laughs> yeah. No, there, I think there's a lot of potential for remote sensing of I believe these there is things. a crowd of pumice 
migrants coming to the country. There we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, any more questions? So before we thank uh, uh, Chris and again, I just want to mention that remember she showed a really cool 3D scanning of the pelvis? She actually brought a 3D printing version of that as I just did. So, um, a, we forgot it in Long John's office, though. So. Yeah, and then she just forgot about it. So, that is my <laughs> so we'll bring it up to the reception. We have John and John. Uh, uh, we can play uh, soccer. John Okay, so let's uh, thank. Uh, <laughs>